Hello and welcome back once again uh, as we are sliding into home base. We're almost done. Uh, and so we're going to be moving into the very last segment uh, of our lectures today. And uh, specifically what we're going to be doing is talking about labor. Uh, before we do that, uh, I know you'd miss it if I didn't. So let me just plug my book one last time and tell you to buy a step-by-step -step guide to the principles of microeconomics. If you are not already in my class, uh, it will give you a lot of helpful tips as to how to solve all the sorts of questions that you see in your own economics course. Now, uh, that all said, let's get into labor. Uh, so that is what we're going to focus on today. We're going to focus on the market for labor, right? And it is a market, right? It is a market in which people uh, buy and sell something, right? And that specific thing that they are selling is their time and effort, right? Their labor. Uh, and we're going to focus on it as sort of a way of, uh, you know, bringing together many of the things that we've talked about throughout the course. And we're sort of going to focus on it as a big uh, labor market that we can apply a lot of the things that we know about already. So we can bring it all together. Uh, now there's a lot of reasons to focus on the labor market as, as a place of focus as we finish things out. Uh, one of the reasons is that the labor market is just very, very big, right? Uh, it is, of course, more than half of all income goes to labor, right? as you might expect. And most people get all of their income from labor. You, you probably will end up spe getting, spending most of your life in the labor market. Uh, and if you're not you know, a laborer, you know, selling your labor, and that's how you get most of your income, then you'll probably be hiring people, uh, and you'll be on the other side of the labor market. So it's something that we all come into contact with, certainly, uh, which makes it a very important part of the economy. Uh, it also has important implications for distribution, right? Since most people get their income from the labor market, the way that the labor market operates has a lot of implications for the way that stuff is distributed in the world. Uh, so there's a lot of important things that come out of the labor market itself, which is a good reason to focus on it. The other reason, and I sort of hinted at this before, is that it lets us apply all the sort of stuff that we've been doing this whole time, which makes it a good place to end because it means that we can bring everything together. Now, obviously, as a market, it's someplace where we can apply supply and demand and with it, things like elasticity and all that other nice stuff with supply and demand that we talked about, like shifting curves around and everything. Uh, it brings in the concept of utility, which we talked about, right? how uh, people make individual decisions. Of course, the decision of how much to work and where to work and what kind of work to do, those are all individual decisions that people have to make on the basis of their utility. Uh, of course, it also brings into play things like production. We talked about competitive market production and how firms maximize their profits. And one of the ways that they maximize their profit, as we covered before, is choosing how much quantity to produce. But another thing that they have to choose when figuring out how to maximize their profits is how many people to hire, right? They have to both work on things on the selling side and on the buying side, right? In this market, they're going to be the consumers of labor. So they're going to come into play too. Uh, it also brings in the stuff that we've talked about since midterm two, right? Pricing power uh, is a relevant thing in the labor market, uh, as is game theory. Yeah, there are some game theoretic aspects that are going to show up here and asymmetric information. Uh, we talked about signaling before, and we're going to talk about signaling here in the labor market as well. So it brings together all this sort of stuff, and it acts as a little bit of a review session uh, for all of us. Now, before we really get into talking about what the labor market is like and applying all these things to it, a quick little aside, something to keep in mind, because this is easy to get reversed from the way that we typically think about you know, the economy. But remember, the labor supply, the suppliers of labor, those are the employees. Those are the people who are working because right? they are providing their labor. They're providing their time and effort to the market and they're getting paid for it. They are selling something and they're selling something to the demand side of the labor market, the consumers of labor, which are the employers. If you have a business and you hire people to work at your business, right? You are a consumer of labor. Uh, so this is important to keep in mind because it's easy to flip around, right? We typically think about the production side of the market or the supply side of the market as being the big companies, right? But in this case, it's the other way around. It's the individuals uh, who are being the producers in this particular market. So keep that in mind when we start talking about things like labor supply and labor demand. Uh, and of course, what we're talking about here is the market for labor supply and labor demand. Uh, and what is being sold here is human effort and time. What you are uh, contributing to your employer is your time and effort. And that time and effort comes with a price. And that price is going to be set by something like a supply and demand curve, just like the price in all the other sorts of competitive markets. 
that we've talked about before. So let's start thinking about how those concepts, supply and demand, apply to the labor market specifically. And we're going to start by looking at labor supply. Uh, now, uh, labor supply, got to keep in mind, is just like any other supply curve, it is the quantity that you want to produce at a given price. But let's translate that into labor. Uh, and so instead of talking about quantity, we're going to talk about labor, the amount of labor that you provide. And instead of talking about price, we're going to talk about the wage, the wage that you are offered in order to get you to work, right? They want you, you know, the employer wants you to work. They want to buy your labor. Well, they got to offer you a wage in order to get you to, to agree to do it. Uh, and so we have to think about how much labor would you be interested in producing in providing at a given wage that is offered to you. All right. So let's, let's actually just draw out very briefly. Uh, what a labor supply curve looks like. Okay, so we're going to start out. It's going to look very similar to what we've done many times before. Uh, uh, but this time we're going to label the axes differently. Uh, we are going to, for, instead of putting price up here on the y-axis, we're going to put wage, W. Okay, and instead of putting a quantity down on the x-axis, we're going to put L, or labor. Right, the amount of labor that you are providing. And then we will draw our nice supply curve, labor supply curve, LS, okay? And what this is telling us is at a given wage, we follow that over, and that will tell us how much labor we want to provide at that given wage, okay? It operates just like every other supply curve where we plug in a wage instead of a price, and we get out the amount of labor that is gonna be provided in this market instead of a quantity, okay? But it's the same basic idea. Now, thinking about it as a supply curve uh, brings in some other interesting aspects that, once again, sort of clash with the way that we might typically talk about the labor market in day-to-day -day conversations. Right. So, first of all, something to keep in mind is that, just like in the other supply curve, the uh, amount that you, the quantity that you find on the supply curve, the labor that you find here, is the amount of labor that people want to provide. Right. It's not the actual amount that's being produced necessarily, it's the amount that people want to provide. So if I said, okay, the wage that I'm offering to work at my business is 30 bucks an hour. Uh, and I said, okay, well, who wants to work for me at 30 bucks an hour? And 100 people raise their hands. Uh, but I say, well, I only have 30 positions available. Well, I'm going to hire those 30 people, right? But the labor supply at that wage was in fact 100, right? 100 people wanted to work at that wage. And that's what this labor supply curve is telling us. Now, the reason why this is an important distinction is because it's a pretty common occurrence that there are people out there who want to work, but are unable to find a job. We in fact call these people unemployed, right? They want to work at a given wage, but they are not able to find a job uh, to work at. Okay? So when, when economists, and in fact, when most people say unemployment, the term unemployment, they're not just referring to people who don't work. We're referring to people who want to work at the available wages, but they simply cannot find a job for some reason. Uh, there are not enough jobs out there, uh, or they're not able to get hooked up with the right job, right? There, maybe there's a, a good job for them in Minnesota, but they happen to be in Oregon, and they're just not going to make the trip, right? Uh, and, you know, this also keeps in mind, right, there are some people who don't want to work at the current wage. We can talk think about people like children. Children generally don't want to work uh, at a job, no matter how much money you offer them. Or retirees. Retirees probably could make quite a bit of money if they came back into the labor market, but they don't want to. They're retired, okay? Uh, or people like homemakers, people who work in the home. Uh, you know, they probably could go out and get a job, but they would rather stay in the home and provide uh, their, their work there. So all these sorts of people, they do not want to work at the current wage, as opposed to somebody who's unemployed, who wants to work, but cannot find a job. If you look at uh, sort of the groups of people, and this is both how economists think about it and how if you hear the term like unemployment in the news, this is also how they're talking about it as well. You can sort of think of people as falling into one of three categories. Over here on the left, we have the red group. These are people who don't want to work at the current wage. Uh, you know, if you offered a child $20 an hour to work, uh, you know, they still probably would not take that full-time position. Same thing with a retiree, okay? Uh, then over here on the right, we have people who do want to work. They look out in the labor market, they see what kind of wage they would be offered, and they think, well, uh, do I want to get a job at that wage? Yeah, yeah, I do, right? That's that group over here on the right. Now we have the big blue circle, uh, and that represents every, everybody who wants to work. Those are people who are called in the labor force. 
The people who don't want to work are not in the labor force, right? We don't consider them as being a part of the pool of potential workers because they don't want to work, right? As opposed to the people who are interested in working, those, that is the pool of potential workers. That is the labor force. Those people are in the labor force. Now, within that group of people who are in the labor force, some of them actually do find a job, uh, and we call those people employed. So the people who are unemployed are the ones who want to work uh, but cannot find a job at the current wages. All right. So that's something to keep in mind. So we've got this idea of labor supply and what labor supply is actually telling us. So what is actually going into this labor supply function? What is determining the wage at which people are going to be willing to work? Uh, or at a given wage, how many people are going to want to find those jobs? Well, just like with all sorts of other production decisions, right? Supply is always about production. Uh, this is a production decision as well. And so we have to think about, well, what are the costs of production here? What is the cost of getting you to your job uh, and getting you to put your time and effort into that job? Now, of course, it is what you are giving up. It's the time that you are giving up, right? Every hour you spend at work is an hour that you don't spend at home or doing something else. And so we can sort of split up uh, all the activities that people do into two different categories. One is called market work, and that's everything where you're in a job getting paid for work. And the other is leisure, and that is literally everything else. It's a pretty broad term that economists use, but it literally refers to everything else. It includes, you know, things that you would traditionally call leisure, like going on a vacation, uh, but it also includes things like sleep or doing chores uh, or mowing the lawn, right? Those are less fun, uh, but they are also considered leisure because they are not market work. So when you're thinking about trying to get somebody to work, uh, the trade-off that they face when they're deciding how much am I going to work is, well, the more that I work, the more time I have to give up doing other things. You know, that, the, if, you're, if you're not working at all and you're considering taking on a job where you work one hour a week, you're probably not giving up much of importance, right? Maybe you watch one less television show. Uh, but you know, as you work more and more, let's say you're working 40 hours a week and you're thinking about taking on a 41st hour, well, what's the trade-off there? Well, you're already taking a lot of time off to work uh, from your leisure and maybe working an extra hour, that's, you know, you're not going to get to see your kids as much. Uh, or you are going to, you know, you're going to leave your house a little bit dirty, you're not going to be able to clean it. What if you're working 80 hours a week and you're thinking about working an 81st? Well, you know, you can see that you're having to give up more and more valuable things. So that's the trade-off that we're facing here. It's a trade-off about time uh, and how valuable it, that time is that you're giving up at home. And these, this trade-off goes into a marginal benefit equals marginal cost decision, just like every other decision that is based on trying to figure out what's the optimal amount of something to do. So we've got marginal benefit equals marginal cost. Uh, and so what are the marginal benefit and marginal cost in this situation, right? We can write down, we want to set marginal benefit equal to marginal cost. Well, what's the marginal benefit of working one more hour? Well, it's the wage. The wage is what you get paid for working one more hour. So if you work one more hour, you get paid the wage that adds the wage to your amount of money that you have. But you have to give up the time that you would have spent at home. So the marginal cost is the value of the time you give up at home or doing whatever, wherever else you would have spent that hour instead. And you, so you are going to work more and more and more until you hit the point where the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost. And then you will stop and you have found the amount of work that you want to do. You have found the labor that you are willing to supply at the current wage. And if the wage goes up, well, we're going to be willing to give up more hours because the you know, marginal benefit just went up. So we're going to be willing to go to a higher marginal cost as well. If the wage goes down, we're going to work fewer hours because that's going to be, well, okay, now the wage is not so high. The marginal benefit just went down. So we're going to have to retreat a little bit until we find a marginal cost that's a little bit lower. Right? If you cut somebody's wage from 20 bucks an hour to a dollar an hour, right, they're only going to be willing to work. Uh, to the extent that the time that they're giving up at home is worth less than a dollar an hour to them. Right? So, you know, that's, that's this marginal benefit equals marginal cost decision going on. So given that this is the trade-off that we're facing, given that this marginal benefit equals marginal cost decision is what's going into that labor supply uh, function, uh, 
well, what's going to happen here? What's actually going to move it around? Right? What's, what's, what are the real world things that can shift labor supply uh, back and forth? Right? Because we're interested in how this thing shifts. Just if you think way back, we talked about supply and demand in general. We started moving those curves around. That was where all the interesting stuff came from. So we're going to want to shift this supply curve around as well. So what is going to shift the labor supply curve? And there are two main things that we're going to talk about. One is changes in population. So if you think way back to supply and demand, we talked about how when the number of firms uh, in a market increases or decreases, that's going to shift the supply curve around, right? Because there's simply more or fewer people available to sell something at a given price. Same idea here. When the population shrinks or grows, that's going to shift labor supply left and right uh, because that's going to change the number of people who are around to work at a given wage. The easiest way to think about this is immigration. If a bunch of new immigrants come to the country, right, there are a lot more people around who are going to be able to work at a given wage, and that's going to shift labor supply to the right. right? We're going to get more labor supply. All right. Uh, that one's pretty straightforward. A good example of this is World War II. Right? So in World War II, uh, lots and lots and lots of soldiers went off to the war, uh, which, of course, reduced the amount of workers who were available to work at things like factory jobs. So what do you think would happen to the labor supply in the United States during World War II? Well, we have a lot fewer people around able to work at a given wage, and so that's going to shift labor supply to the left. Okay, so let's think about what is going to happen when labor supply shifts to the left there. And we can draw this out just like we were doing before. All right, so we got wage up here on the y-axis. We have labor on the x-axis. We have our labor supply just as we drew it before. And let's toss on a labor demand. I'll get more into that later, but let's just say that we can do labor demand just like regular demand. So we're going to shift our labor supply to the left as a result of the war. We get a higher wage, right? We shift from this old equilibrium, which is where labor supply and labor demand intersect, just like we got the equilibrium before where supply and demand intersected. Uh, we're going to get the equilibrium wage and labor at the place where labor supply and labor demand intersect. Now we're going to shift up to a new equilibrium that happens to be at a higher wage and a lower labor amount, right? So we see a ra an increase in wages. And we show what this says is that we should see an increase in wages at the factory jobs when all the soldiers go off to World War II. And this is, in fact, what happened. Uh, and as a result, right, we see these rising wages. We see an increase. We see sort of a shortage going on for workers in factories. This is one of the things that led to a bunch of women coming in to work at those factory jobs during World War II, which is one of the things that sparked one of the biggest changes in the labor market over the past hundred years, uh, which is women coming in to the labor market. Uh, so women came into the labor market partially in response to these increased wages uh, and the reduced uh, quantity of labor. Uh, and then we saw all these changes coming about as a result of it. All right, so that's one thing that's going to shift labor supply around. Another thing is changes in wealth, okay? And I'm specifically talking about changes in wealth, meaning the amount of money that you just sort of have sitting around in the bank account. Now, I'm not talking about changes in the wage, right? As we talked about before, right, the labor supply curve is never going to shift in response to a change in the wage, just like the supply curve is never going to change in the response to a change in the price, right? Because we're all the labor supply curve already tells us how we're going to respond to the price or to the wage. We're talking about changes in wealth, changes in the amount of money that people have sitting around at home. And this has to do with the fact that, well, it's a time trade-off. And one of the, and what you're giving up when you work more is time at home. Uh, and you're doing it in, in exchange for the wage. But if you already have a bunch of money sitting around at home, you don't really need the wage so much, right? You don't value the wage quite as much as you did uh, if you're already pretty rich. And so if somebody gets really rich, right, you're going to have to offer them a lot more money in order to get them to come work for you, right? Uh, you could probably get me for a much lower wage than you could get Bill Gates, right? Because Bill Gates has a whole bunch of money sitting around at home. He doesn't need that additional wage. So you'd have to pay him a lot more to get him to do anything for you. Uh, so what this is telling us is that if something changes about people's wealth, if people become wealthier, that should reduce their willingness to work, right? Because they don't need to work as much because they already got all the money they need sitting around at home. Uh, and so we can think of an example of this uh, with, with the housing prices. So think about what is going to happen to wealth when housing prices go up. Okay, uh, so a lot of people own a house. And so if the price of their house goes up, that means that they just got wealthier, right? They're now sitting on a more expensive house, which means that their net worth just went up. 
So, you know, now they don't need to work as much, right? So maybe some of them are out there thinking, well, I was, you know, counting on this house to be my retirement account and it just got to be worth more. So now I don't have to work as much to fill in the edges of my retirement. Great, I'm not gonna work. And so we should expect to see fewer people working at the same wage when the wealth goes up. And this is in fact what we see. Uh, here's an example of a study right here uh, where they looked at a 10% uh, increase in housing prices. And as a result, they saw a 0.6% decrease in labor supply. Not a huge effect, but that's exactly the direction that you would expect uh, given what we have here about the labor market, right? Wealth goes up, you don't need to work as much, you're not gonna work as much. All right, so those are two things that are gonna shift labor supply around. Changes in the population, more people means more labor supply, and changes in wealth. More wealth means less labor supply. So let's move on to the other side of the market. Let's talk about labor demand. Now the interesting thing about labor demand that we haven't really been able to look at with any of the other uh, demand or supply curves we've seen so far is that we can actually see where it comes from exactly. Uh, you know, before, when we talked about a demand curve, I would just tell you what the demand curve was. I would say, well, the demand curve is price equals 40 minus 3Q, right? Something like that. But with the labor demand curve specifically, we know exactly where it's going to come from. And we know that because, if you remember, right, who are the consumers in the labor market? It's the employers. And those employers are trying to maximize their profits. And so by seeing what choice of hiring can maximize their profits, we will then know exactly what their labor demand looks like, right? Because I can tell them, okay, here's the wage that you're gonna have to pay in order to hire somebody. And they're gonna think, okay, well, if that's the wage that I'm gonna have to pay, uh, I can figure out exactly how many people to hire in order to maximize my profit. And then that's gonna tell me how many people I wanna hire. So I observed the wage and that told me how many people I wanted to hire that is exactly the description of what a demand curve is, right? You see the price of something, you decide how much of it you wanna buy. You see the wage of workers, you decide how many people you wanna hire. So let's think about how this might work, okay? So just like with anything else, uh, the employers are going to try to set marginal benefit equal to marginal cost, right? No big surprise there. Uh, and just like with anything else, all we gotta do is figure out, well, what are marginal cost and what is marginal benefit in this particular scenario? So marginal cost, that's actually easy to figure out, right? Hiring somebody for an additional hour or hiring an additional person, right? You're gonna have to pay them the wage. So the marginal cost here is the wage. But what's the marginal benefit? What is the benefit of hiring an additional person? Well, it's how much additional profit they bring to your business. So. It, all we got to do is figure out how many people do we have to hire such that the next person we hire is going to bring us exactly an, uh, the wages worth of additional profit, right? They're going to bring us as much money as we paid them to bring it to us, right? So we're breaking even at that point, marginal benefit equals marginal cost. So, well, then how do we figure that out? How do we figure out how much uh, additional profit that new labor is going to bring to us? And it actually turns out to be pretty easy, right? We just gotta look at three things. The first thing we gotta look at is the wage, right? We already have that one. The second thing we're gonna look at is the price. And specifically what I mean here, I'm gonna call that P, the price of the good we are selling. So let's say we're talking about a car factory, for example. Okay, you're thinking about hiring people to work on the line at your car factory. The wage is what you have to pay one of those people. The price is what you sell a car for, okay? We got one more thing we got to do. And this is a new term for you. Uh, it's the marginal product of labor, MPL. Now what this is, this is how much additional stuff that new worker is going to provide to you as a result of you hiring them. So again, we're talking about a car factory, okay? Uh, let's say that we make 10 cars a day. And if we happen to hire another person, then that person will take us from 10 cars a day to 12 cars a day. If that's what happens, then the marginal product of labor for that person is two, right? They produce two additional cars for us as a result of us hiring them. And we can take each of those two additional cars and we can sell them for the price. And then we know exactly how much additional profit that new hire is going to get us. And that amount is going to be the price times the marginal product of labor, right? How much profit did they produce for us? Well, how many additional units did they make for us? The marginal product of labor. How much did we sell each of those units for? The price. 
multiply them together and you have the additional amount of money that they brought in and we're willing to hire people until that additional money that they're bringing in is equal to what's going to go out, the wage, the wage that we're going to pay our new worker. And since the marginal productivity of labor is going to be based on the number of people we hire, right? The first person we're going to hire is going to be very valuable to us. And then as we hire more and more and more, they start to get crowded. Uh, the useful machinery is all tied up. You know, we don't really have anybody anywhere to put anywhere, anybody else. Uh, then it's going to go down and down and down. So it's going to, it's going to vary with the number of people we hire. And so what this means is that if we know what the wage is, we can then calculate out how many people we should hire, which once again is the labor demand curve. So we have an exact way of getting from the idea of profit maximization to knowing exactly what the labor demand curve is and, which we couldn't do before for other, uh, other types of mark demand curves, we know exactly where it comes from and what it's supposed to look like, which is pretty neat. So let's take this idea and let's put it into action. Okay, so let's look at a firm here. Uh, and let's say that for this firm, uh, the wage that they face is 40. All right, so if they hire another worker, they're gonna have to pay that worker 40. All right, uh, how about the price? The price that they sell their goods at is gonna be 20, okay? Uh, and the marginal productivity of labor, the additional amount of product, marginal product, that the laborer will provide for us is 20 minus L. Right, so the first person we hire is going to make 20 units for us, the second one's going to make 19, and so on and so forth, okay? So, let's figure out uh, what our labor demand curve is, right? So we know that our labor demand curve is wage equals price times the marginal product of labor. Simple as that. Uh, so now all we're going to do is plug everything in and we'll know exactly how many people we want to hire. So let's, let's first plug in on the right side to just see what this labor demand curve looks like. So we're going to say that wage is going to be equal to 20 times 20 minus L, right? So if we solve that out, we get that the wage is equal to 400 minus 20 L. And that is our labor demand curve, right? It looks a whole lot like any other demand curve, right? A regular demand curve might look like price equals O 40 minus 2Q, right? Same idea here. Instead of uh, price, we have the wage, and instead of Q, we have the amount of laborers. Now, here's our labor demand curve. Uh, we happen to know what the price of, what the wage of laborers is. It's, it's 40. So let's plug that in too and see what our optimal labor should be. So we're going to have 40 equal to 400 minus 20L. Uh, we subtract 40 from both sides, add the 20L, we get 20L equals 360. Uh, and if we divide both sides by 20, we get L equal to 18. Okay, so this firm should hire 18 people at the going wage. And because we also know what the labor demand curve is, we, we know exactly how many people they would hire at any other wage, right? If we knew that the wage went up, we would know exactly how many fewer people to hire. We would just plug the new wage in and resolve it. If the wage went down, we would know how many additional people to hire because we would just you know, plug in the new wage and solve it out once again. So that's the cool thing about labor demand, right? We can solve for exactly what it's supposed to be from the fact that everyone's trying to maximize their profit and then we have labor demand exactly as it should be. Uh, we have this whole labor demand curve uh, and it tells us a couple of interesting things. So, it, and, and when we get to the question of how do we move this labor demand curve around, it becomes immediately self-evident because we know what goes into that labor demand curve. It's only two things. It's the price of the good that you're selling and it's the marginal product of labor. So what's gonna move the labor demand curve around? Well, it's gonna be things that move the price of the product and it's gonna be things that move the marginal product of labor. That's it. So one of the things that could move the labor demand curve is the price of the product. If the price of the thing that you are making goes up, you're gonna to wanna to hire more people, right? Because the thing that you're making just got more valuable. So quick, hire more people to make more of it so we can sell more of it. Simple enough. If the marginal product of labor changes, and you can sort of think of that as if the productivity of a given worker changes, you're gonna to wanna to hire, um, hire, hire more or fewer people depending on whether the marginal productivity of labor just went up or down. So imagine for a second, they come out with a new machine that makes all your workers more efficient. Well, you're gonna to wanna to hire more people, right? Because each of those workers can produce more doodads for you. Uh, and so you're gonna to wanna to hire more of them, right? Because each of them is now producing more stuff for you. They're, they're more profitable for you. You wanna hire more of them. Uh, or imagine you get a new manager in who makes all of your workers more efficient and makes them work faster or something like that. Uh, and so in that case, again, you're going to want to hire more of them. 
because again, they become more productive. That means they're more valuable to you, which means that you want to hire more of them as the uh, employer. Uh, so those are the two things that are going to shift labor demand around. And this also gives us an interesting uh, feature of labor demand, which you'll notice here that we have two sort of sides of the equation. We have the wage, which is what workers get paid. And we have price times the marginal productivity of labor, which is the amount that basically the workers produce for their employers. Those two things are equal to each other on the labor demand curve. This sort of translates to saying labor is sort of paid what it's worth. Pa people are paid with the amount that they produce. Uh, and no more, no less. Sort of as you might expect it to be in a competitive market, uh, you get the sort of nice result that people are paid exactly what they produce. Now, if that sounds pat and simple to you, uh, it's because it is, right? That's not necessarily the only thing that we're, we're gonna, there's some complexities in the labor market that make that not actually true all the time. And we'll talk about a lot of those in the next lecture. But when we're at this simple part right here where we're just looking at the competitive market, people are paid exactly what they produce, which is a nice and convenient result. So to recap briefly, the two things that are going to shift labor demand around, uh, change in the price of goods, uh, if the price of what you're producing goes up, you want to hire more people, and changes in technology, whether that technology is you know, literal technology or it's something like an improved managerial method, uh, anything that makes your workers more productive, you're going to want to hire more of them at the same wage, it will shift the labor demand curve. Let's take a quick example of this. Uh, lots of fun. Let's talk about the bubonic plague. Uh, so in the 14th century, the Black Death or the bubonic plague swept through Europe and killed about a third of the entire population, which is a lot. So let's ask, obviously, the most pressing question related to this, which is what is this going to do to labor demand? OK, uh, what's this gonna, effect is this going to have on the labor market in general? So let's think about this. OK, so we have two sides of the labor market. Let's first think, uh, what is this going to do to labor supply? Well, obviously, it's going to shift labor supply quite a bit to the left, right? It's going to shift it to the left because we're going to have fewer people around, which is going to shrink the number of people available to work at any given wage, which, of course, is going to shift labor supply to the left. So I'm going to draw this out. We got wage up there. We got labor down there. We got our labor, oh, excuse me, labor supply curve up there. And we're going to shift that to the left and end up with a new labor supply curve over there. How about labor demand? Well, labor demand is probably going to move a little bit too, right? Because, you know, a lot of these people are farmers. They are producing food. And now that there are fewer people to feed, there's less of a need for food as well. Uh, so the price of food is likely to drop for that reason. Uh, and so you're going to see a leftward a drop in the price and a leftward shift in labor demand as well. However, uh, you know, there's still uh, a lot of the landlords out there who own a lot of this land. and They're going to need about as many farmers as before. So... I'm going to say the labor demand will probably shift as well, but it's going to shift to a much smaller degree uh, than labor supply is. And so as we know from last time, what's going to happen to our equilibrium uh, point uh, when we see a large leftward shift in supply and a small leftward shift in demand? Well, we're going to move from this point right here, uh, which is at this old wage and this old amount of labor. And we're going to see up ourselves at this new uh, labor, uh, this new equilibrium point right here which is going to be at a higher wage and a lower quantity of labor. Now, no surprise that we get a lower quantity of labor uh, because there are fewer people around to work anyway, right? We couldn't really have any more labor. Uh, but the wage is going to go up as well, right? Because we had that huge leftward shift in supply. A lot fewer farmers around. So the ones that are left, you want to do as much farming as before or anywhere near it, you got to pay them a lot more to get them to do it. Uh, now, uh, Keep in mind, this is taking place not in a market economy, but in a feudalist society uh, where people are not necessarily used to bargaining for prices in this sort of situation. So we would not necessarily expect this actual shift, this actual movement in, in the market, this adjustment in the market to actually happen. But these forces are still at play. And so the natural wage that you would expect a, you know, a feudal serf to get paid is going to go up. Uh, and so people are going to start demanding more wages, which is exactly what happened. And then because people were, you know, landlords were used to paying the same wages they had for years and years and years and years and years and thought perhaps ordained to do so, uh, they refused. A lot of them refused to raise wages at all, even though the natural wage rate was going up. Uh, and as a result, there were things like riots uh, and uh, massive labor shortages. And as a result of these riots, eventually the wage did rise up as it should have done. This is one of the things that led to uh, a lot more political power resting with the peasants, uh, which led to a lot of good things a little bit later on. All right, 
So, so far we've covered the labor market uh, and uh, as we've, we've covered it sort of as a standard application of our supply and demand model. So far, so good. Uh, however, as you might have noticed, we've been making up to this point an assumption that is obviously untrue. And that assumption is that there is a labor market. You know, just as we've talked about, you know, the market for apples before, you know, there's a market for apples, we've talked about there being a labor market. And obviously that's not true, because think about what that implies. As we've been drawing this out, there's a wage. But obviously, people get paid different wages. Some people get paid more than others. Uh, and if there was a single labor market, that wouldn't happen. So clearly, we have not quite finished out our model yet. So what we have here are what are called wage differentials. And that just means that different people get paid different wages. And so we have the question of why is this? Why do people get paid different wages? Now, there are a number of reasons why this is, and a number of them we will go into next time. But the, today, we're just going to cover one of the most simple, and that is human capital, the concept of human capital. Now, if you've taken a human uh, resources class or something like that, you might be familiar with this term. Uh, but basically, human capital is a, person's, is a person's set of skills and abilities, right? Different people have different sets of skills. Uh, and so, you know, they're going to have different amounts of human capital and different types. Right? You wouldn't want to hire a mechanic to do your surgery, and you also wouldn't want to hire a doctor to fix your car. Uh, you know, different people have different types and amounts of skills. And some of these skills are perhaps innate, maybe you're born with them. Uh, some of them are learned re education and training. Right? So education has a lot to do with the amount of human capital that you have. Now, why do we call it human capital? Well, we call it human capital because it sort of works like an investment, right? You are, you know, I imagine in college right now, what you're doing is you're building up your supply of skills, right? You are adding on to your skills. You're investing in yourself, right? Just like you might invest in a stock or a bond. And you're spending a lot of time and money right now to do it with the hopes that it will pay off later, right? So it's sort of like an investment in that way, sort of like a capital investment, except it's in a person. So we call it human capital, right? Now, the nice thing about human capital is it lets us give one explanation for those wage differentials. It explains why different people get paid different wages, because they have different sets of skills. And this does two things. Uh, one of the things that it does is it means that some people have simply more skill than others. And so you might expect them to get paid more, right? As I mentioned before, we're sort of in the world here where everyone gets paid the amount that they produce. And so a, someone with more skills who's more productive is going to get paid more. The other thing that it does is it means that people can't simply switch from one labor market to another. Like I said, you're, you, can't, you wouldn't want to get your, a mechanic to do your surgery. Uh, and so if the, if the wage of doctors goes up, mechanics aren't going to be able to just switch over to be doctors uh, in order to you know, respond to that incentive. If you remember back when we talked about firms entering and exiting markets, uh, we talked about how you know if the way if the price in one market goes down, people are going to want to leave that market, and if the price in the market goes up, people are going to want to go into that market. But what human capital does is it means that you can't just switch in and out that easily, right? Because, like I said, if the wage of doctors goes up, it's not like you or I can take advantage of that fact very quickly, right? We'd have to spend years and years and years getting those human capital skills uh, that doctors tend to have in order to qualify to enter that market, right? So that allows there to be different wages in different occupations or, or between different types of people. Uh, and so we can think about this in terms of two different kinds of human capital. One is general human capital, which is just sort of general skills that apply to all sorts of jobs, you know, things like being able to read and write uh, or do basic arithmetic or show up on time. Uh, those are all parts of general human capital. But we also have specific human capital. Those are the specific skills that are associated with the uh, industry or occupation or even the uh, uh, actual firm that you are at and working at, right? That you build up specific skills, uh, like the doctor builds up the skills to do surgery uh, that I do not have, okay? Uh, and this part, the human capital is actually very important. It's a big part of the labor market. Uh, estimates suggest that uh, every additional year you get an ed of, ed of education that you get, your earnings go up by about 10% which is quite a lot, right? And what that suggests is that a lot of what employers are paying for when they hire somebody is not just their effort and time, as you might expect it to be in the sort of basic one market labor market, uh, but it's paying for those human capital, for that human capital, paying for those skills uh, that they want people to bring to the party, right? Uh, so th th this human capital thing is really gonna explain a big part of the wage in general, uh, 
uh, but also uh, explaining differences in wages between people. Uh, because this means that each occupation is acting as its own labor market that people can't substitute between very easily. Right? It's going to take some time to switch from one labor market to the other, which means that it's going to take some time to respond to wage changes in one market or another, which means that those differences in wages between occupations are going to last for quite a while. So to sort of sum everything up, uh, labor supply comes from the decision to work or spend time at home, right? It's that time trade-off between labor and leisure that really determines how much you want to work, which means that things that are going to shift the labor supply curve around are simply the number of people who are available to work. More people come in, more labor supply, people leave, less labor supply. The other thing that's going to shift uh, the labor supply is you know, how much do you need to work? How much do you actually need that wage? So if you become wealthier, you're not going to want to work as much. So that's going to shift labor supply to the left. Labor demand comes from the attempt for, of employers to try to maximize their profit and try to hire the, peop the number of people uh, that will maximize their profit based on how much wage they actually have to pay them. Uh, this means that we get a nice labor demand curve that we know exactly where it comes from. We get that wage is equal to price times the marginal product of labor. I'd recommend just sort of putting that one in your head if that uh, derivation doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, make sense to you. Uh, but that, of course, all uh, leads to you know, labor market dynamics in general. But at a, up to that point, we assume that there is a single labor market, which is not the case. Right? We can split into many, many different labor markets because of human capital. Uh, human capital is the set of skills that you have, either general human capital, which are general skills that apply to a lot of jobs, or specific human capital, uh, which is specific skills that apply to specific jobs. Uh, and because of that, you can't just substitute between one labor market and another to respond to wage incentives. Uh, and so that's going to allow wages to be different across different occupations. Right? We're going to have sort of one of these labor markets that we drew out with labor supply and labor demand. But we're going to have one of those and a different one for every single occupation, uh, which is going to explain why different people get paid different amounts. Or at least it's one explanation. We'll talk about some of the other ones later in the very last lecture. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, and I will see you next time.